St. John Chrysostom, although feasted in white, has many of the accoutrements of a real martyr. You probably know that he died in exile, far, far away from his Episcopal see, that very important one, Constantinople. He had been very outspoken and therefore lost the favour of the powers that be. Hence, he had to be moved further and further away. Indeed, the emperor, it would seem, used even Arian support to make it difficult for him to stay put. He was already exiled the first time in the Caucasus area, Armenia, very far. Then a second time he found his way towards Pontus and he was being compelled to walk on and walk on and he was dying of exhaustion and trying to warn them that, that was the case. But they compelled him to walk on and he died walking on. Therefore it is essentially a martyrdom. However, it was, a, in a sense, among Christians. This Aryan thing, and this link also with the Eastern Empire, was a problem. The Aryans, of course, took refuge in the north of Europe, the Goths, and they were a force to be reckoned with for a good while. The whole period of these first centuries is linked with quarrels about the person of Christ, what we call Christology. It took several big councils to unravel the theological mess. Indeed, it was only really at Chalcedon 451 that it was actually solved, therefore a few years after he died. And it was there that we have essentially what has remained the only thing is that we have the development of theology in the West even afterwards, which causes problems till now in the East. The question of the procession of the Spirit. Now precisely as a reaction against Arianism, it was felt as time went on that an insistence on the divinity of Christ had to be underlined and that there was no question of the Son being a creature, and that if he was consubstantial with the Father, as had been defined, in some way the Spirit also was proceeding from him. And, by instinct, it crept in, bit by bit, into the practice of the West, to include it in the singing of the liturgy. And when the East woke up to this fact, they weren't amused. Now, already we have the fact that there had been a political tension between East and West. As you probably know, the East did look towards Peter, the Patriarch of the West, that Patriarchate of Rome, as an important, very important rock, always thought to be faithful theologically. But there was the fact that Rome had been weakened politically, but as the East had remained an empire, and therefore there had been this instinct on the Eastern part to put Constantinople on a pedestal. It had the support of the empire, which of course was a problem. And we still see the problem, for instance, in the discipline of marriage in the East to this day, being so linked with temporal authority and power and influence and pressure, therefore, they sometimes had to toe the line or else. And so we have in the East creeping in this, what we call, economia, this possibility of limiting the damage, of allowing one second union if the first union breaks down in marriage before a priest. But theologians will tell you that the second one is probably not sacramental. How can it be? 
It's, however, their way of sorting out the problem of the recognition that marriages do break down. But you can see where it came from. The West was more free and wanted freedom and never accepted that. Now, there was a reaction because over the centuries, the East still being strong was in some way consulted, at least for a formal approval, of the successor of Peter. It might only be in name, but still it was there. And the West was never really happy about this. Why should a temporal authority have power over the Sea of Peter, even on paper? And so one can see how when the Pope, no less, crowned Charles the Great, Charlemagne, on Christmas Day in 800, as what? Essentially the equivalent of the Emperor, but in the West beginnings of the Holy Roman Empire. Then Rome was able, as it was gaining strength in faith over Europe, to have something of what it had lost and to be therefore a power to be reckoned with even for the East. So politically there had been a tension, but there was still one church with the sacramental life flowing in the veins of East and West. But this Creeping in of the clause and from the sun, filioque, was a theological problem. There were also cultural issues. Of course, the big one of the language, but that's not huge, because the language of the early church anyway was Greek. And quite a lot of Greek was spoken for a good while in chunks of Europe. We have the big Greece, Magna Grecia, of the south of Italy, for instance whereas Latin was the case in our part of the world. However, there were cultural differences which were going to impact also on church life. There had been the last of the great ecumenical councils of the undivided church in 787, when it was defined that icons, images, were allowed because it was only a reflection of the reality of the incarnation. However, in the East, there was always the insistence that they should not be totally realistic, but stylized. But as in the West, three-dimensional images, and with a certain plastic art which represented reality, were allowed. So there was a cultural difference coming in there, visible in their church structure. There was also the fact that in the East, the bishops were never married, at least from an early date, not entirely in the early part because it wasn't defined, but very soon that came in, but the bishops were always from the non-married clergy, whereas the presbyters on the local level could be ordained after their marriage, but could not be married should they lose their wife, and also could not be married after receiving the major order. Also, that applied to the diaconate, that the deacon had to choose before ordination, and afterwards he was fixed in the point that he was at with regard to marriage. So there was this difference there between East and West. However, it was no division of heart and mind, essentially, until what happened between the Pope was... Leo and the Archbishop, the part Patriarch of Constantinople in what was essentially a fairly energetic disagreement. Unfortunately, it made more complex by the distance so that a certain Humbert had to, in the name of the Pope, act. He went over to Constantinople and was kept waiting outside for a long time, a few weeks even, I'm not sure, but it's certainly a long time. And, of course, wasn't amused. And when eventually they met, it got fairly heated. And the upshot was, on Christmas Day, in the Cathedral of Hagia Sophia, Constantinople, the 
representative of the Pope placed a bull of excommunication there before him in church, which of course led to a retaliation immediately with the same coming from him. But they thought, like most explosions, it would die down and pass. It didn't. So we're stuck with it. Now, it's a bit sad because no one thought it would have such a long-lasting effect. And we have lost, by that very fact, the thing that we most need for our balance. Right now, we look towards what has come out of us, Lutherans, Anglicans, and further afield, Methodists, and all that goes with that, rather than to the East, when we talk about ecumenical rapport. And it's quite incomplete and imbalanced. Because whereas in the second case we're handling not schism but heresy, in the first we're handling a split between situations of genuine church life. Now what happened in the East was that as time went on, they had to readjust their theology, their ecclesiology, to justify the new situation which was seen to be lasting. So they eventually got used to a notion of autocephalous churches. Cephalos is head, so each bishop, but essentially each patriarch, is head. In some churches they are called pope, but that doesn't mean quite what we mean by pope, but the word is used in Egypt. And they have complete authority of their own. Now, the B side of that is the, the churches are fairly nationalistic compared with our situation. It also means that there can be differences amongst them on certain things, which perhaps sometimes is not without importance. But above all, it means that they can never ever have an ecumenical council, but as we can. The danger is, of course, that if we do, an important balancing factor will be absent, we haven't got them and we need them, but we have got Peter, and therefore we have the promise. But I just want to make a jump. It has come out in recent times that the Lord does not want this to carry on. He has raised up in our time, in that half of Christian life, which is the Holy Land, well actually Damascus, which is north of it, a person who has been obviously a puzzling case for the Vatican. She is of Eastern Rite, her name is Myrna, but she's under Rome. And she has had very strange phenomena around her for a long time. But always in Eastern mode, nevertheless making appeal to Rome. Icons oozing and doing miracles and the like, already since the 80s. And things happen around Easter time when the two dates coincide. And we have ever increasing clarity from the Lord that he is behind this and is giving signs that he wants this healed. It is not from him. We also have indications that Pope Benedict, before he actually stepped aside, drew up a document indicating a model by which this could be done. And it would seem that the date that would be adapted, adopted would be that of the East, which is interesting because it's the, as it were, date which is stuck there from force of habit. We have had to adjust to catch up with the loss of time with regard to the sun. It was done under Pope Gregory, hence with the Gregorian calendar. But they just kept things as they were, and the Lord kept things as they were in the miracle of the holy light. He does it the same time, same each, here in the hands of the same person. Holy Saturday at Easter. At their Easter. It has to be in the hands of the patriarch which descends from James, the first bishop of Jerusalem. And it's in the holy sepulchre, the miraculous light from heaven. So it would indicate that peacefully we could actually negotiate. However, the problem is this, that in the East, because of the progressive separation 
and even absence of contact in some situations, such as one ethos, there has been a entrenchment of positions and almost a feeling of refusal when it comes to anything to do with what they see as the modernized, therefore corrupted, tainted, contaminated West. We respect their position, but it's very difficult now to dialogue. And only the Holy Spirit will ever get through that. I'll just finish. We've just finished the year of the centenary of Fatima, and there has been a lot of looking into the third secret. And also the question of what was meant by the eventual conversion of Russia. And it would seem that Lucia was questioned on its meaning, whether it meant actually just becoming a country of prayer again, or whether it actually meant coming under Rome. And it would seem that that latter case was actually the question eventually. Of course, it would mean respecting their autonomy with regard to rights and traditions. But can you see the massive effect that a bloc such as Russia would have if it were to come in communion with Rome? It would have a huge effect. I just finish with this. There is that clause in the fourth memoir, which eventually the Vatican started to use, because it was in the third memoir initially of Lucia, which refers to, in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be kept. Because after that, there is the etc. That would imply that there were other words. Now, in another teaching I've given, that actually at the Senator in Athboy, it was in October, I went into great detail with regard to that because there is now, it has been leaked out through the research of people like Antonio Sochi, that there are people in the know who actually know that there is that written part because the bit that we had was the vision, but there is also the commentary on it. And the vision on its own makes no sense without the commentary. And so, this, it would seem, because of what Benedict XVI has indicated, coincides with what was actually explicitly made known and approved at Akita in Japan. The message of Fatima. But what part of it, question mark, can be heard in Akita? They are the same. And so, we see there the crisis of faith, also the errors coming into even teaching of certain bishops and their consequences over the flock is all foreseen by heaven and it was going to start to crack precisely when it was supposed to be opened in 1960. It was opened by St. John the 23rd. He looked at it and was frightened and judged it inopportune to make it known. I finished there. Why? <laughs>